All right, looks like everyone's just about settled and in. Glad you guys can be here tonight. Welcome. This is the PhotoFocus Lightroom Hangout, and it is brought to you in part by both PhotoFocus and Aftershoot. We'll take a look at Aftershoot a little bit later. Uh, it's a very useful tool to help you use AI to cull your photos and get them organized. We'll talk about the culling process later. That's the act of picking the best pictures that you want to actually edit. So uh, thanks to the folks at Aftershoot for helping us put on this event. Uh, today, we're going to be taking a look at really four different things. So we're going to be talking about photo prompts and how you can use these to really come up with ideas for your photography. We'll then talk about uh, how photography is an extension of creativity, and we'll be looking at some different ideas that you can use there. We're going to talk about NFTs and how they are impacting the photo world and the active AI culling, and we'll just tackle some general open Lightroom questions as well. So we've got a guest expert who's going to help us with all these topics and jump in. So a nice, diverse evening tonight. My name is Rich Harrington. I'm a visual storyteller, and I am also the publisher of PhotoFocus. We've been publishing PhotoFocus now for 23 years with daily tips and inspiration to help with photography. So glad you guys can join us. Uh, I, when I get a chance, write things down or publish video courses. So you might have seen a book or a course through the years that I've put out. And if I can, I like to help folks. So I put down all the good ideas I have and try to get them out there. So if you'd like to connect, feel free to just reach out on LinkedIn and you can find me there. Our guest this evening is Gemma Polari. Gemma is a photographer as well as a creator of photo prompts. We're gonna talk about that. She's a mom of two boys, a physics teacher, and also an author. And she's joining us today from in Australia. How are you today, Gemma? Good, thank you. I'm doing well. I can see there's a lot of people coming in from Australia around different states too, so it's nice to be here in company. Good, good. Did you send to your mailing list or did you just have some fans or is it just a good time zone for Australia? I guess Monday first thing. I think it's probably just the time zone. That would have been a good idea if I'd sent it out to my <laughs> mailing list. In hindsight, that would have been a great idea. <laughs> That's okay. You can tell them about the replay. Yeah. So, so welcome. Uh, where Tell us a little bit about where you're coming from and how you found yourself in shooting pictures. Yeah, I, um, I've always loved, um, I've always loved doing photos. And ever since I was little, uh, my grandpa bought me a, um, a little compact film camera years and years ago. And um, that was, that was the first camera I got started on. And, you know, when you're taking film photos, you can't take very many before the film runs out. So I have a lot of, um, I had a, a lot more uh, restraint on my photography in the, in the initial stages. And then, um, yeah, as I, as I started to, you know, work part-time jobs and stuff like that, I got um, a little couple of little compact ones, little Olympus, like waterproof ones and stuff like that. And then eventually uh, when I finished my uni degree, my parents bought for me my first, um, my first, digital SLR, which was a Canon 400D back in 2008. Um, and I was so happy I burst into tears when they bought me the camera. <laughs> I'd also finished my degree. So then I had more time to actually do things, which was, um, which was great. So yeah, so it's been, I've been shooting for a really long time and I've gone from, um, you know, forcing my friends and family to let me take photos of them to um, now, ironically, some of my friends who used to hate me always taking photos of them actually have paid me to take photos of them now, which is, which is a nice change. So um, yeah, so I, I've been doing it as a, as a side business for um, a couple of years now, since about 2017, when my, um, my five-year-old was, he was one year old then. And um, yeah, it's kind of gone in a couple of different ways not just straight shooting um into a few different areas like um i do the prompts now and i um i got into web design because i taught myself how to do a website for my own photography business and then other wedding vendors were very excited to hear that i knew how to do websites yep. and um so yeah so that kind of spun out of it as well so i do a bunch of different stuff excellent well let's jump into that first topic which is prompts so, uh, you know, you, I did a little bit of research and I, I checked out some of your prompts and for folks who are new to this, uh, a prompt is kind of a posing idea or a recipe to follow for, for making pictures, because a lot of times we feel stuck or lack confidence when talking to subjects. So how'd you come up with this and, and maybe share a few of these with us? 
Yeah, so I that's exactly how I came up with it was that that's how I felt when I was starting out. So um, going from working with people that I knew to people that I didn't know, I really wanted to feel like I had some tricks up my sleeve, I guess. And um, because, <laughs> sorry, coughing, um, because I have a teacher background, we're kind of, I, I think that's sort of my style of thing. I, I like gathering ideas together and codifying them and, you know, making it into something that's a useful resource. And I started out by just gathering information and brainstorming prompts. And I created a, um, I created like a cut it out, print it out and cut it out and make your own cards set of, um, of prompts, which I shared on a Facebook group. And it went like viral for me, which was like a thousand people were like, Oh, I love this. So, um, that was pretty exciting because I'd never had anything go even semi-viral. So um, sure. that was just the first thing I did. I had it on my uh, wedding photography website and it was like download the PDF and cut it out and stuff like that. And um, yeah, so that's kind of where the idea came from. And then when I, um, when COVID lockdown started over here in 2020, I um, wasn't shooting very much anymore. And I'd also just had my second son and um, so while I was at home sitting on the couch, breastfeeding a lot, I started the blog and turned the, um, turned the PDFs into more of like a structured kind of thing. So, yeah, so then I, and then I started teaching myself um, the, uh, you know, app design kind of stuff to build the app to go with it. Um, and, and that's where it's up to now. So the app is almost ready, not quite, but almost ready. So I'm hoping to get that out to people fairly soon, which is going to be exciting. Um, Do you have a prompt yeah, or the, a couple that you can show us a sample of what some of these look like? Sure. Yeah. So I'll just see how I can share my screen. I'll bring it up on my, on my blog. Um, I, I really like the prompts for working with, um, for working with families is probably the one that I, I use it the most with, with couples as well. Um, weddings and stuff like that when you've got the free time to do a little bit more of the, um, you know, the, the portrait session, that kind of thing. So, um, so what the prompts generally look like, I'll just share my screen now, if I can. You should be able to. Let me bring that one up. So this is, this is the most recent one on the blog, which was, um, hug it out. So this is a, how they how i'd sort of write them is a bit of a blurb about how to use it and they're just things that you can uh as little scenarios you can set up this one you can ask the kids sit the kids up next to each other ask one to give each other the most aggressive hug that they can and it always looks cute because then they give little smiles and stuff like that piggyback pose is kind of a common one that people um use for a whole bunch of different situations you can use it for couples you can use it for siblings um and it just gets everybody's heads all nicely close together we don't want um when you're when you're piggybacking people you don't want anybody to be too big or too small so kind of trying to line everybody up is a good way to do it um and this one is one i love belly to belly that's a, one i love for, for families particularly if they have little kids is getting one of the parents sitting down and then the little one sitting on their lap and just capturing those interactions between them. So that's the most recent one on the blog was, um, was about hugging it out. And then at the end, I always give some creative, um, some creative ideas of just, you know, something a little bit different. I tend to, I tend to get as many of the, like, okay, these are all the different ways I can think of to add, incorporate hugs in a more, you know, interesting way first and then here's some ways you can mix it up sort of at the end so yeah so that's um that's what i love to to do with little kids particularly you can you can do um you can do the piggyback pose with um with couples as well i love seeing it when they actually get like the gr the bride piggybacking the groom like and carrying them around i love seeing that one um it's just yeah, it's just a really nice, I, I tried to kind of include some ideas to sort of mix it up, make it a little bit different. Excellent. Excellent. Well, let's, we'll come back to one more of those in a moment. 
Uh, Gemma, why don't we jump into a little bit of Lightroom post-processing? I can do one first if you want to queue up an image, and uh, we could take requests tonight as well, folks. So if you have any particular techniques you're wondering about or things you'd like to see, just put them into the Q&A pod or the chat pod, and we'll tackle some of those. Gemma, do you have some images that you can share in a second, too? I can, for sure. Yep. Okay, great. Let me uh, just switch on over to Lightroom Classic. And uh, I'm going to show a little bit of color grading. Here's something we did. Uh, actually, our one of our behind the scenes hosts. This was a picture of her that we made the other day, and uh, we did this on set. So uh, she's laying against a backdrop with a piece of plastic on top, and then uh, we coated the plastic in Rainex, and then used a mixture of water and glycol to kind of create these bubbles. But what I want to do now is push this a little bit further. Uh, with the develop. So I want to show you a couple of things we can do to bring it to life. Let's go ahead and just close off the tips there from Lightroom. So first up, one of the things that I want to do is talk about profiles. So profiles are really cool. You're going to find them here in the profile browser, and there's different ones you can choose from. Now, if you open up a raw file, you'll find different ones as a starting point, but these are really fun for quick color grading recipes, and you'll see them organized. And so I'm gonna go with one of these here that has more of a blue feel for the water, and then I can adjust the amount. Now, what I don't wanna do is turn her skin too far, but I just wanna introduce a bluish cast to the highlights. Then I can come down here to the color grading controls and look at shadows, highlights, and midtones. So put a little bit more blue there into the highlights, but then in the midtones, go opposite of blue and still bring out just a little bit of that skin tone. And I'm gonna put a little bit of gold in there. So it just feels like underwater type lighting, which is fun. Then we'll come up here into the overall area for contrast. And I don't wanna put a lot of clarity because that's gonna really affect the skin. So I'm gonna actually go with a little bit of negative clarity here, which creates the softness of the underwater feel. You see how it sort of, softens the light in the skin. And actually, same thing, a little bit of negative dehaze. But then I'll go the opposite direction and put the texture back in. So what that's doing there is negative values are actually creating a softening effect, which I like on the skin, but the texture brings back out that foreground water. Now, let's just take advantage of our color controls and we've got our on image tool. This lets you click right on an area so you can adjust it. So notice how I'm shifting the hue initially for the blue. And then I can come over here to the skin tones, choose saturation, click right on the skin tones and adjust those independently until it's the right overall feeling. So this on image tool is really useful because you could tweak the hue, the saturation or the luminosity and notice how easy it is to just dial in the different areas until it feels right. Now I'll just share with you one of my favorite tips for sharpening and I'll go down to detail here. First up, take this and place it on an area that you care about so you can see what's happening. Then I'll hold on the alt or option key and this lets me really see what's being adjusted so I can now adjust the amount and the detail. And again, just holding down alt or option lets you really see that change as you're sharpening. There we go. And we'll just come down here to effects and put a very gentle darkening of the edge with a heavier feather. Now, one of the things I like to point out is you do have these great comparisons here. So this lets you put a before and after side by side. And you can see how we just leaned into the feeling there of being underwater, just adjusting the color slightly and a little bit of negative values just creates that softness of diffused light that I was going for, for a shot that's meant to look like it's actually underwater. So I hope that's just a fun little portrait idea there, guys. Uh, this was done obviously not underwater, but just a nice controlled situation and uh, a lot of fun to make. Cool. Uh, Gemma, how about I toss over to you to edit a picture or two, and then uh, we'll take a look at maybe another prompt. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll, I'll just get my screen shared again. And if you guys have any questions for us or any requests of types of images you'd like to see edited, feel free to let us know. 
This one I've got um, here is one I, I set up in my house as a studio. So you can see my um, my ukulele on the wall at the back there and, you know, the, the room going into my laundry there. So this I set up as a um, little mini studio in my kitchen. Um, so I'll just show you guys what the setup was. You might have seen this article already where I showed the setup, but I'll see if I took a photo in this setup here. All right, this one gives a bit more of a, an overview. So I had um, I had the light stands with the with the backdrop on it. This was one of my Easter um, Easter setups, and this was super easy to set up. It probably took about half an hour to get everything in place. And if you didn't have kids pulling at it and you had didn't have to stop them like trying to move everything, it would take you even less time than that. But they were trying to quote unquote help, and so it took me about half an hour. Um, but yeah, so when I, when I go to edit this, then I wanted to, um, I wanted to really sort of enhance that studio kind of feel. So whenever I edit, um, whenever I edit, I always start with, um, with auto settings first, and then I have a preset that I've saved, which is all my, all my standard, um, it's all my standard things that I always apply. So the basics of it are, I'm going to apply the preset and then I'll tell you what the main settings are that, are, that it changes. Um, so in my many, many, many presets here, we've got um, the main things that it's changing is that it's dropping the highlights. So I can't remember when I learned about dropping the highlights down all the way, but at some point over the last many years, I learned that dropping, uh, someone told me that dropping the highlights all the way down is the best way to bring out the detail. Rich, is that something that you do a bit of as well? Uh, I tend to push highlights and whites a little bit opposite of each other and blacks and shadows the same way, but yeah, you can use quite a bit yeah. of highlight recovery. Yeah, and um, I, I've always found ever since I started using a digital SLR that, um, dropping the highlights works well it doesn't work as well on a jpeg and that's you know when i didn't shoot in raw it is something that helps when you when you shoot in raw um shooting in raw was something that i didn't do for the first very many years of using a camera which is very distressing now in hindsight that i have a whole bunch of jpegs that i can't ever edit to make them look better than they could have been um black dropping the blacks is the other thing that i always do because i really like that kind of like high contrast um real color but it's a bit more kind of punchy i don't like low contrast so much um the other things it does in this in this preset is that it does a few adjustments in um the color grading and on a lightroom classic you can see that a little bit easier so i won't worry about going into that there but it's just really minor stuff in the shadows so it's basically like lifting the shadows um, into a more of a warm color, a uh, warm color kind of, kind of range. So to do that in Lightroom, I'm using Lightroom here rather than Lightroom Classic, the color mixer, sorry, the color grader underneath the color mixer is, is really useful. So you can, you can control all of the shadows, the highlights and the midtones separately in terms of their color, um, in terms of their color contrast and their color temperature, which I really like. So the next thing I do then for this um, for this image is to crop it. So I wanted to have it as a square, so that's easy. Um, but what I wanted to what I wanted to show is just how to take out some of these little creases in the background and just make that background look a little bit more a little bit more uniform. So when you've got a um, when you've got a backdrop, if you can get it perfectly flat and straight, that is awesome. If you have small people helping you it's less, um, it's less possible. So I always, um, I always try to get it as good as I can in camera, but I'm not too worried about taking stuff out um, afterwards because it does make life a little bit easier, especially if you're, if you're photographing newborns and stuff like that, like sometimes it's not really worth disturbing a newborn to get a little dot of mark off their face when you can easily take it out of, um, out in post. So try to get it as good as you can. And then I'm using the healing brush just to take out that, um, that crease there. This one here is less obvious, but i take it out as well. And um, then when you zoom back out again, then you can see, hang on, let me try and zoom back out without actually adjusting anything. There we go. Um, it's looking much more smooth in, the, in those backgrounds there. 
The other thing I think that I would do here is just to, on this side here, because of how my flashes were set up, it's a little bit darker on this side. So I'm gonna use one of the um, one of the gradients. The new masking things in Lightroom are really cool. Um, you can select just the subject, select the sky, and then these are all a little bit more finer grain control than they used to be. So they've, they've carried those changes from Lightroom into Lightroom Classic too. So the new masking tools in Lightroom Classic are also a little bit, a little bit better than they used to be. So I'm just going to adjust that very slightly just to make it a little bit even. And that's about all I'm going to do with that image. Very nice. Very nice. I'm going to show you guys uh, working with a landscape type photo now really quick. And uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the importance of profiles, but I'm going to actually show you three photos that were all shot on an iPhone. Now they look not quite right. And that's because it's really important when shooting raw that you pay attention to these profiles. So I want to show you something here. If I open this up, you're going to find profiles that match the actual camera manufacturer. So if we open these up, you'll see that depending upon the camera, there's going to be a profile that actually matches what the camera manufacturer has. So here we have Apple's recommendation for color and their black and white. And you can just notice what a tremendous difference that does for the HDR and the dynamic range recovery. So, and that's gonna be for any raw file. Below the Adobe recipes, you're gonna always find ones that are camera manufacturer recommended. And I really like using those because they go a long, long way. So you see here, if I switch this to Apple and I go to the actual Apple Pro Raw, look at what a tremendous difference that does on the details of proper balancing. So there is again, Apple Pro Raw profile, and it brings all of that back. Now, looking at the histogram, I like to point out to people that this histogram is interactive. So you can play with and start to recover. So like Gemma was talking about, I'm gonna really recover those highlights, but in this case, bump up the midtones next to it a little, and that lets us recover things nicely. I can bring over my shadows but then go into the blacks and bring them back down. So it's just nice that that's all interactive. Similarly, Tone Curve also has an on image adjustment tool. So this lets you come right into the image itself and start to pull up or down. So you can go to a different area and really massage. In that case, you see how I'm just shifting the curve around by just clicking on it and making it interactive. In all cases, this is a lot of fun because you just grab the adjust tool and you can finesse the different parts of your tonal curve to get that value. And then if you go into the color tool here, this lets you select luminance. And for example, I could target the night sky, darkening or brightening it. I can come here into the golds and control the exposure on the building there. So you just see how powerful that is that you can actually adjust those areas very independently, as well as the saturation and the hue for those. So in this case, I could just roll the green a little bit so that the trees look more like the nighttime sky. So I just want you to realize that these color tools are really quite powerful. And you could just see there, I could punch right in and say, oh, let's grab that and bring down the luminance there of just the green and that better matches the scene and do the saturation controls as well. Now, when you are zoomed in like this, you can see your noise a little bit better. That might be hard on Zoom to see that, but I like to punch in. I told you about the option or alt trick before, so you could adjust the masking threshold slider. That helps a lot to really sharpen the edges, but you can also do the same here with the noise slider. When you hold down the option or alt key, you can better see the actual noise and this helps you as you're trying to decide how much detail to preserve or how aggressive you can get when cleaning up that noise. It's just a lot easier to see in grayscale mode. So I hope that gives you guys some ideas on how powerful those on image tools are, as well as using the correct color profile, because that just really finesses things there. And we can dial that in. If we do this here, remember, you can also protect the highlights on this vignette. 
So this lets you play with this type. And you can see here as we're adjusting how we can play with the actual highlight priority here. And this gives you control more so over how the whites are gonna be affected as you add that thing in. So hopefully that gives you guys a few ideas. I like this one the best here. I'm just gonna back that off slightly. And let's come back now. We haven't even touched the global tools. I sometimes like to actually do this at the very end because it really lets me finesse that there and just dial in the perfect amount. By the way, as you're playing with your shadows and highlights, uh, a lot of times you're gonna stop there when you get the end. But remember, as you use these, you can actually push them even further. So when you run out of the basic adjustments, that's where the curves can come in and the ability to do separate luminance adjustments right here. So I could just click right there on the actual light area. It's doing a combination of the yellow and orange sliders to control the light that's coming off of that building. So it just lets you really interactively click and drag on the image to fine tune it. And I just find that to be a lot of fun as a way to really finesse the images and bring them to life and get better results. Okay, Gemma, let's maybe see one more prompt from your collection and then uh, I'd love to see another image if you got one to share. I think you might be on mute. Cool, sorry about that. Um, I will go into my website again. So I've, I've set it up, I've recently reorganized things on the website so that it's a bit easier for everybody to, um, to browse. So um, I, I think you guys are in America, you guys are coming up to senior photos soon, right? So let's dive into, so I, I've got, this is the teenagers section of the prompt. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different ones in here. Um, we've got icebreakers, we've got capturing laughs for seniors. So we might have a look at the, uh, we might have a look at the laughs one. Let's have a look. So when you, um, when you're working with teenagers, I find that it can, eat, it can go one of two ways. Like they, they can be cooperative or they just really, really don't want to have their photos taken. So I suppose for seniors, you're, you're, you know, they're there to have their photo taken. So you're going to be, they're going to be a bit more cooperative. Um, but we've got some, we've got some ideas here um, for people who are, if you're wanting to add a little bit of something different to your senior photography so that it's um, looking a little bit more of an editor, editorial kind of style for your photography rather than a classic like sit in portrait, sitting down portrait. So some, some prompts here. Um, what's the weirdest food you've ever eaten? What's the most out of character thing you've ever done? Tell me the story behind your phone wallpaper. So it's just getting them into the session with some ideas of um, just things to break the ice, things to talk about so that you're not just kind of, you know, trying to take photos of someone who's sitting there awkwardly going, oh, what do I do? Um, what season would you be? If you were going to be one of the four seasons, what season would you be? Are you a good dancer? Can you get them to show you some dancing? That kind of stuff. So that's one of the prompts that I can, uh, I'd suggest for teenagers. Another one um, is getting them to show you things that you, that they love doing. So adding something to that, uh, adding something to that whole album that you can kind of enhance their, their story. So not just, not just photos of them, not just portraits of them, but things that they like to do as well. So um, you can get them playing their instrument. Um, you can get them with this, with whatever sport they play a particular treasure or a particular um, item that's really important to them. You can, you can, if they're, if they're worried about actually like doing the thing in front of you, like focus on the details, get up close, um, capture some of those like little, little tiny moments. And um, with the, with the creative one, with the creative ideas on this one, I've suggested you can get them involved. So can't get them behind the camera help them have an, an option to create, to take photo and capture their creative passion in a different way as well. So there's all kinds of different, um, there's all kinds of different techniques to on the, on my blog of, to just fill out something rather than just the classic portrait, not to say that a classic portrait isn't important or isn't a, uh, you know, a key part of it, but 
after you've taken the portrait and you're going, okay, well, we've done that. We've got that in the bag. What else can we add to this to sort of like round out the whole picture? That's how I've kind of aimed to, um, that's what I've kind of aimed to, to communicate. Very cool. Very cool. Do you have another picture you'd like to share for developing? Sure. I can, uh, I'll pull that up now. I'll stop share for a minute while I just find one. While you're getting that queued up, I'll take just a moment to show people a little bit about Aftershoot. And then uh, if you're ready after that, we can yeah. jump right over to you. So sounds good. Uh, let me make sure I'm sharing the right one here. <laughs> it's always fun to get the right windows shared when you're bouncing around in Zoom. So give me one second and I'll make sure I do the same thing. There we go. All right, so uh, thanks to the folks at Aftershoot for uh, helping sponsor tonight. If you guys have not had a chance to try Aftershoot out, I would really suggest you check it out. It's a very cool tool. There's both a free and a paid version. And what it's able to do is analyze your images and make recommendations as to which ones are best. Now, you still are gonna be involved in this, but it uses multiple criteria and tests to help identify your best photos. And this is the process of culling. And I know as a photographer, it's really easy to spend so much time obsessing and zooming in and checking sharpness and second guessing yourself. So Aftershoot can really help you with this part. So it really speeds it up. So what it does is anytime that Aftershoot sees more than one image that's similar, it can actually put those into a group together and join them. And so it then goes in and picks the best one or two, depending upon the settings you put, per group and identifies them. So let me show you what that can actually do really quick. And then uh, we'll come back to Gemma. So give me one second to just bring it live here. And I'll bring this across. There we go. So with Aftershoot, let me just take this live. So what you do is quite simple. You add a folder of images and just grab any folder you want to process. And you can do this before you bring it into Lightroom or after, it's fine. Select the uh, shoot that you wanna process. I'm gonna go here and do this session and I'll just hit import. It will start to immediately load them and analyze. And so this puts them in. Then what we do is we click start culling. Now you tell it what you want to do. So we can add color labels for selected, highlights, duplicates. You can see it starts to identify the different ones. It's up to you. If you want, in my case, I'm just gonna make both closed eyes and blurred red, and uh, that's fine. And I'm gonna go with green for selects. And then you have star ratings. And so it can apply stars of which ones it thinks are best. Selects are the five star and highlights are actually a subset of those. It uses four stars. And if you want keywords added, it can actually put keywords right into the file for things like blurred or duplicate or closed eye. When you click next, you now decide what you want. So this lets you choose how it's gonna group. So as you go to the right, this is controlling the amount of blur. So shallow depth of field is okay, uh, pretty tack sharp or really in focus. Then if we decide to group duplicates, you can decide how many groups it makes. So as you move to the right, it's gonna put more photos per set. And extreme can actually ignore any sort of time, but strict is usually pretty good here. Then you decide how many you want. And so this is the top 20%, top 10%, and then the number of highlights. Once you're all set, you just click start culling and it will begin to analyze. Now, if you are not doing other things in the background, you can actually kick up the speed there to use the maximum amount of system resources. And what it starts to do is an analysis of those photos. Now you can queue up more than one job, but it'll just process these. And when it's all done, it'll vary depending upon time. It can actually find all of those and then let you know which ones are best. So if you don't like the call, you can restart it and the second time through, it goes much faster because it's already done the analysis. And so you could just apply different rules. So you can see here, it's just about done. And what it's doing is it's identifying, for example, I had three pictures that it felt were blurry. So in this case, we just didn't nail the focus. And then here's another ones where it identified that the eyes were closed. So we can narrow that down. And here we have people with their eyes closed, not good expressions. 
and we can go through and it will start to pull them all together. So let's go ahead and just close this. There we go. And you see it starts to narrow it down. So in this case, it was able to identify within. Now, if I want to be more aggressive, I could say, you know what, go ahead and put more duplets together. In this case, it's not going to matter if there's as much changes, it'll be a little bit more aggressive in combining. And when I start the cull, it will start it back over. And that's going to get the total number of sets down and it'll analyze here. There we go. And so you can see any place where it puts a number, that's where it's indicating that there was alternates. So here it felt that that was the best. And you can see all the faces punch right in if you want to check focus on them, any of that nature. You can see the best of the best and as it makes its way through. Easily go to the next photo, same thing. And so as you step through, it's going to identify the best picture from each pose and find those for you. Then once you're all set, all you have to do is decide what you want to export. But in this case, I was able to go from about 140 photos down to the best 43. When I click export, then there's a one click handoff to any one of these tools. Or if you've already imported them into Lightroom, all you have to do is select your images, come up here, save your project, and then save the XMP files. I'll just rewrite the XMPs and they update. Now I can go back to Lightroom, find those actual pictures that I imported. Let's just go into the library here. And I can just reload those XMPs. So I'll just come on in. Let's just go into the actual folder. There we go. 155 pictures. And I could just tell it that I want to reload those. And so you can actually go in and reload the XMPs. Uh, I always forget the other, read metadata from file. That's the command, <laughs> metadata, read metadata from file. And that will read the embedded information and update all your stars. So now it's super simple. And I could just be right there in Lightroom and start to sort on the different criteria. So I can see any of those attributes such as only show me the five star photos. And I took that from 150 down to the best 37 ready for client review. And if there's any I don't want, of course, I can obviously get rid of it. But you see how easy that is to narrow it down to all of these different shots from the very normal poses to the slightly silly ones. It still found the best of each pose that was sharpest with the eyes open and everyone engaged. So that's how Aftershoot works. Uh, if you guys want to check that out, the free version of Aftershoot is going to let you go through and automatically detect closed eyes and blurred photos. And it lets you go through and quickly zoom in to manually review and cull. If you want to use the AI culling to identify the, all the different star ratings and the sharpest focus and all the other tests that it does, best emotion, then that's the pro plan. But even the free one can just quickly find your blurred photos in your eyes at no cost, and then it hands it off. So that's what that tool does. All right, Gemma, I'm ready to pass back to you if you are ready to show us some developing. Yeah, sure. Um, I was just going to say about Aftershoot as well. I've started using it um, for big jobs as well for anything where I've got um, anything where I've got a large number of photos to cull through. And I, 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 I photograph weddings for a studio. Um, one of my friends that she runs her studio, I photograph weddings for her as a second or lead photographer. And um, at the most recent one, because I'd been trying out uh, after shoot the last couple of months, I when I was driving back from the wedding and called her to just give her the debrief, I said, "Oh, yeah, I've, I've got the I've got the photos ready, um, but there's going to be there'll be a lot. So, have you heard of after shoot?" And she was like, "Oh my goodness, I was just about to tell you, don't even worry because I'm using after shoot." So yeah, I was I was about to start spamming her with information about it, and she was like, "I'm already all over it." <laughs> Good, it so, is yeah, a big time saver. Oh, it's amazing. It's just so much easier. The only thing I change um, is I switch out the f the star rating for the highlights and the selected ones. So I make mm -hmm. my highlights five stars because um, that's how I have always done it in Lightroom to make yeah. the for the, you know, social media stuff. So that's a really good thing, too, I think, because if you in that preferences window where you're starting, if you 
deselect overwrite it anything that you have already done in lightroom will stay there and it just takes care of all the ones that you've not had anything to do with so i really like that very cool okay yeah, i'm um, gonna i'm gonna switch back into lightroom sorry rich what were you gonna say nope go right ahead cool so i picked this image which is a um a backlit one so i wanted to just show my process for um adjusting a backlit image so that we can uh, get the lighting balance right there. So again, as I always start is with auto. When, I, um, when I'm working in Lightroom Classic, I apply auto on import. So usually, um, usually what I do with my process is I get my photos off my camera onto my network storage and I rename them by timestamp. So um, I don't know, I've, I've tried to get my camera to rename name them by timestamp, but it doesn't appear that Canon is able to do that in camera. So I use a tool just to rename them all when, as they get imported and I um, store them on my NAS. I apply um, I apply settings on import. So I, I, I usually apply auto settings and auto, um, and then I, and I apply a metadata preset. So my photos as they come into Lightroom Classic have had the metadata all updated to make sure it's the um, whichever job it is. If it's a if it's a job for clients, I'll make sure it has um, it has you know their copyright information stuff like that in it. So that's the first step. And then I I bring the photos that I then want to work with into Lightroom. So I I have experimented with different ways of going from Lightroom and Lightroom Classic, and I wrote extensively um uh, different articles on photo focus about recovering like when your lightroom catalog gets full because starting starting in lightroom is and then trying to get things back into lightroom classic is so much more complicated than going from lightroom classic into lightroom so if you start if things have only ever been in lightroom and you're trying to get them into classic it's quite complicated and you end up with all these like duplicate files everywhere and stuff like that so I then learnt my lesson and started everything in Lightroom Classic and then take it into Lightroom as if I'm, um, you know, just popping these files into my briefcase to work on. So everything goes into Lightroom Classic now. And then I take the current set that I'm working on comes into Lightroom and that's where I do all this stuff. So usually when a photo has, when a photo lands in Lightroom, it's already had auto applied to it. Um, Again, I use the same, I'm going to use the same preset and that's going to do a fair bit, but I still think that this backlighting um, needs a little bit extra work. So again, what I've done with that preset is the main things are dropping the highlights, uh, dropping the blacks. I then make some changes into, um, it also does some, some things with uh, dehaze and clarity. So it always ups the clarity and the dehaze slightly. And you can see that that's made a bit of a difference, but in this uh, this area here, this is my son on his first day of school. Um, I think that he needs a little bit more, a little bit more of a boost there. So I'm going to I'm going to jump down into um, shadows, but rather than raising the shadows universally, I think what I'll do for this image is I'd like to just focus on his face. So going into the uh, masking areas, the the selecting subject tool that's now in Lightroom works really, really well. So it just takes a couple of seconds. It detects the subject and then it's going to mask just that area of the, um, of the actual image. I've had a lot of success using this since they brought it into Lightroom and into Lightroom classic. It just seems to work really well. And it doesn't, it doesn't seem to need any, any kind of adjustment of the edges and stuff like that. So that's picked him out nicely. So it's going to go red to show that it's, that he's been masked. And I just want to bring up the shadows a little bit. So his face is not quite so dark. Um, the other thing we can do similar to what you were doing before, Rich, is if we wanted, if I wanted to, if I felt like his school uniform was losing some color, I can just go in and adjust those blues. So I've, I've brought up the shadows, which has helped on his face. I think I don't want to change the background too much and make it too bright, but I think that he's matching the background a little bit more now going back into the, into the, the basic settings into the color mixer we can use those we can use those tools just to bring back a little bit more depth in the blue of his uniform again and i might use that on the background too i often do this for for backgrounds if it's um 
If it's outside, you can use the green sliders to bring about a, a bit of the, uh, you know, bring the background down a little bit. If it's a golden hour shot, you can use a little bit of the orange and the yellow to, to bring it down a bit. So I'll just bring that down just slightly. Yeah, and sometimes it's a combo kind of, of those colors, Gemma. So like that little target to the right there, right above the magenta. Go ahead and click on that and then click on your backdrop and uh, click on the greens and pull. So yeah, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm sometimes, getting sometimes some it's going to be a little bit of two values. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of teal in this background. Oh, it's on yeah. hue at the moment, so. Yeah. So it'll just go different ways depending on if you drag up or down. So it's doing hue if you go left or right. And if you click with that tool and drag up and down, it will shift the other properties. So it can be a lot of fun for just tweaking the colors. Yeah. And it's always um it's always like I think subtle changes always work work best in these color mixer zones. I always use it for solving problems rather than making things look crazy. Um you can use it to make things look crazy too. But the other thing, if we have a look at the color grading, uh, the color grading one is really, that's what I mentioned before. The color grading one is nice for this kind of, um, this kind of thing. If you feel like your shadows are a little bit cold, um, you can adjust just the shadows. You can adjust just the highlights. And that's a really nice way. I find when you're balancing out something that has, um, if you've taken a golden hour and everybody's looking a little bit too orange, just getting in and adjusting those specific uh, channels is really nice. And where people sometimes get confused, just pull away from the color you want to remove. So since it felt a little cold, you pulled away from the blues and just put a slight amount mm. of oranges in. But if it was feeling too warm, you would just pull away from the golds or the reds, depending upon the yeah. color guest. The, um, the other thing that I really am liking in, in Lightroom at the moment is um, being able to share things on the fly from my phone, because that was always such a convoluted process. If I, I'm not very, um, I'm not very religious about sharing, but when I do want to share, I love that you can, you can just go export and it's on your phone and then you can, then, then you can share to social media. So that's something that I think is, um, is something that's a feature that I have really appreciated using Lightroom on my phone for. Excellent. I'll have to show you. I'm using uh, Milio for that, but I'll have a webinar later this week on that. Um, I'll do oh, a yeah. I'll do a quick example here, building on some of the techniques you showed, as well as one that we haven't covered yet, and uh, and that is to take advantage of upright. So this is going to be found under our correction tools here, and so first up, we can of course enable lens profile corrections if we know. Uh, the type of camera we're using or, or what's involved. But in this case, what I really want to take advantage of is fixing some of the distortion. So we'll come down here and using transform, people are used to saying things like auto or level or vertical, and that's all fine. But there's an option here most people miss called guided. And what guided lets you do is draw your own lines. So you can say, hey, that's the top edge. And right here, there's the bottom edge. And then you can click right there and you can see the little zoom in that it gives you. It really lets you be precise here. So you can double check precisely that you're putting that in the right spot. And so you really do wanna use that loop and not just guess here because this tool gets pretty aggressive. So you can see as I start to adjust, I can make sure that's in the right spot. And now I've really perfectly squared up that doorway. And that's so much easier than having to sit there fighting with the tripod, finding the exact right height to create that space. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to refine this a bit and apply a square crop to lean into the fact of this doorway. And this allows me to just sort of position that so that object is centered, giving it that nice balanced feel. Now, Gemma, you did a fun thing with masks and I want people to see how easy these are to use. So we'll just come over here and take advantage of our masks. And I'm gonna start by saying select sky. That will use the AI to choose this, the sky. And then I'm going to subtract and so I'm gonna add a gradient here 
and subtract with the gradient from the sky. And so this lets you create a nice transition zone. So here I have the sky selected with a gentle grad going down. And so if I darken that there, you see how I could darken the top of the sky more than the bottom of the sky. And these are live effects. So you can actually just come in and finesse that, move the midpoint around, and it just creates a really nice variable ND type there where we're just getting a nice graduate from top to bottom, a gradiated filter there. And we could then put a little bit of extra color into that. So looking at that, I'll say that's good. Let's get a little touch of clarity and pop the white point on the clouds while recovering the shadows. And that really creates the dynamic range there so that the clouds are popping and they're not getting darker. And then a little touch of color. Then similarly, we can create another new mask but this time, what I'm going to do is take this mask and duplicate it, but then invert it. And so you can actually start to flip flop these. So you can see that you can start to invert. So there I've reversed the gradient and I'm going to invert the sky. And so now it's selecting inside of this area. So it's selected the bottom here. And so look at how I could finesse the bottom of the frame to really control that. And by using the shadows and highlight sliders, I could literally relight this. And I'm gonna put a lot of texture in there to bring out the wood and the water surface. So that ability to take masks and then start flipping them around is really quite powerful because you can really do some cool things and you still have your HSL color tools. So I can click here and just finesse that there to globally tweak it. So I'm really impressed with what we can do with those masks and those correction tools. I think that you can see there that they're quite powerful and they really let you take control over your photo and what you're correcting or not correcting. That ability to go in and duplicate or subtract from one or flip parts of it lets you get that perfect mask. And so I like to sometimes create a soft blend from top to bottom, then flip everything. And you see how it seamlessly blends back together, but it just totally let me take control over what was some pretty harsh, flat, boring light in the middle of the day. And now I've got the types of shadows and dynamic range that I want that gives me more control. All right, Gemma, back to you. And uh, you also brought up NFTs earlier. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you're thinking there and some of the opportunities that they lead for photographers? Yeah, sure. Um, I love what you just did with that, with the double masking. I think that's a really cool technique. And the um, the transform, like that, when I discovered that tool, it literally transformed my life. <laughs> yes, it, it lets you, <laughs> it lets you, if you have these perfectionist tendencies to get perfect what? composition and not have to worry about yeah. lens issues, or I was a little high, oh. I was a little low, not that we're sloppy so when good. we shoot, but sometimes you could sit there and miss the moment tweaking your tripod yeah. for 20 minutes, or you can get it close and then perfect later. Yeah. Um, yeah. So NFTs, I, I did take a little bit of a, I, I took a bit of a rabbit hole journey through NFTs last year. I think it was when, would it be last year? I don't know. Whenever they started being COVID a thing. time is kind and, of flexible. <laughs> oh, it really is. Um, and yeah, I got, I got quite interested in it and I got, um, I started, you know, hanging out in the virtual spaces where people were talking about them and stuff like that. So I haven't actually, I haven't actually turned anything of mine into an NFT because I, I kind of investigated and I talked to people and, um, I was just more interested in seeing what other people were doing with it. But, um, and, and I spoke to, I spoke to different photographers who have, turned they have produced nf photo photographic nfts um and it seems like the it seems like the the trend is like anything that any way of making you know making an income from your art depends so much on how much of an audience you've got and how much uh, you know how much you can get your stuff out in front of people who want to buy it as well there's um there's a lot of marketplaces for nfts that are uh 
you know, they're cheap to mint things on and they're, um, and they're free for everybody, you know, people can join them freely to, to produce NFTs. But then it's, it's one of those things. It's like, well, there's so many of them that where do you, where, you know, how does someone buy my NFT um, from there? So the gist of it is, I, I know that people are becoming more familiar with it now, but the gist of it is it's a, it's a, a token that represents that you own a particular artwork. So, um, so digital items can be reproduced on the internet as many times as, as they, as you want. But an NFT is a is a encrypted token that says you own the rights to that artwork. So they usually um, there's there's a combination of a, a an encrypted token that's on a blockchain and then a digital file that goes with it as well, or digital files. It could be multiple files. So that's what an NFT is. So it's sort of like a it's like a baseball card or like a collectible. Um, but it's a digital collectible that can't be reproduced in the same way that a baseball card or, a, you know, a dollar bill can't be forged. Um, it's non fungible. That means it can't be duplicated. So it's a it's a similar kind of thing to bitcoins. And um, it's built on that same kind of technology where it's digital. It's a digital thing. And people have been selling artworks on these for insane amounts of money, like crazy amounts of money, but it's usually big artists that already have a, an established career that are selling them for insane amounts of money. The, um, there are, there are people who are, um, doing photography. There are people who are doing photography NFTs, but the ones that seem to be more popular are ones that incorporate movement or some kind of animation and stuff as well. Um, this is one site I like to, I think this it is, is one site I like to recommend to folks. So Sloika, uh, yeah. S-L-O-I-K-A dot X-Y-Z. This was started uh, in part by Ev Chabotarov, who uh, was the co-founder of 500px, which is a popular photo sharing community. So yeah. they do actually let people apply if you would like to submit and uh, you could submit your portfolios and they are working with a lot of um, new artists and undiscovered artists. So they're trying to really leverage the platform and the loyalty that they've brung. So if you don't have a giant built-in audience, rather than everyone having to be famous, they're taking the same approach that 500px took, which is a very highly curated co-op. And uh, this is a great way to uh, learn and and both see a lot of photographers that are succeeding in NFTs, and they're really focusing on quality photography, much like how 500px did. So here, uh, a lot of less famous photographers still succeeding at NFTs. Yeah, and I think that that's the kind of projects that we're going to see coming out more now with it with people are going to start using it more, and it's going to be it's going to be something that sticks around. And it's just going to be a matter of time before those kind of um, it becomes a more well-established way of sharing your work. And, um, and I think that probably, I think it, at this stage, like be, being aware of what it is and knowing how it kind of works is important. If you're an artist working in the space and if you're someone who, you know, is, is, is producing your photography as, as artwork, um, for, for, for me and for people who are photographing family clients and business clients and weddings and stuff like that, I don't see it as much as being relevant, but it, I guess it's, it's just going to be how it's going to be a thing that evolves. And, um, for those kind of photographers that do that kind of more artistic style, I think it is something that people are going to need to become abreast of more. Well, the thing that I found really interesting, I had a chance to go to this year's Consumer Electronics Show. And I look at a lot to do with NFTs of being like all things, you know, there's going to be people that when they order prints, want to know that they're getting one or a number of a small edition. That sometimes that's important to mm -hmm. some folks who are buying. To other folks, they don't care. And so there's really an open marketplace there and, and there's NFTs to support it. The part that was fascinating to me at this year's Consumer Electronics Show was I went to booths like Samsung's and they had the most amazing screens that hanging on a wall. 
And so they'd have these screens that could rotate right on the wall from horizontal to vertical. And it looks like a painting. Then with the push yeah, of the button, that's so it's, cool. a, it's a television. And they actually yeah. had um, non-glossy, super high-res screens that were like 200 PPI screens, like the same resolution of what you'd be printing at if you were printing on the wall. And so I'm looking at these things that are photographic prints that I couldn't tell were photographic prints. I walked right up, yeah. I zoomed in, and then with the push of a button, it's live television or your computer monitor. And so we're gonna see more and more of this. There was also um, projections of short throw projectors that get put like right on the base of a wall to put artwork up. And so I think what we're gonna mm. see is people will be changing out the photographs in their homes based on season more. There's lots of flexibility. And so there are some opportunities for photographers, like all things there's, there's gimmicks and there's, you know, giant things. But I think the idea with NFTs, at least part of it is that a photographer should be getting credit for their work and have a little bit more control over the sale. Well, Gemma, we're coming up on yes. the end. If, can you tell people where they can find your website and Sure. A little bit more yeah. about the prompts that you offered as well. I think you have a, a bundle there that people can get a few of these to get started for free, right? Yeah, so it's all free at the moment. Um, the I've just put it into the into the chat, the the URL there. Um, I think, yeah, those those TV screens, I know we're gonna finish up, but those TV screens, I was looking at them the other day, they are amazing. And I think, yeah, that's that's the really exciting part is that it does give it does give opportunity for flow on uh income as well like it you you don't just sell an item and it is sold it you can have um you can have that item continue to produce income for you every time it's on sold so that's really exciting too because um if another collector buys it another collector buys it the original artist keeps getting credit for it which is really exciting very nice. So yeah, at the moment, um, you can you can get discounted early access to my app if you if you sign up for my email list. It's not yet released, but if you sign up, you'll be the first to know about it. Um, at the moment, everything is all the stuff that's on the blog is is free, and I um and when the when the app comes out, you you can get discounted early access. But yeah, I would love to see I would love to see you on there, and would love to see any photos that you create using the prompts. I love to see that and. Um, I often feature different photographers on the blog and um, and link back to your website so that you can, you know, see them up and up in the different place in the world too. That's great, Gemma. And thank you for for making that resource. I, I know I, I often joke that I'm an antisocial photographer because uh, I find that I have to spend so much time talking to people in my day job that I like to take pictures of things that don't talk. But from time to time, I, I do have to take pictures of people and family members and others uh, because, you know, I'm like the, you know, well, I don't take those type of pictures. Well, you're the best photographer here. Fine. I'll take those types of pictures. But I was looking okay. through your site and there's just some great ideas there to, to help you really feel comfortable. So I'd encourage folks to check that out. Uh, if you guys want to see some of Gemma's stories, as well as other resources, if you're not familiar with PhotoFocus, be sure to check out PhotoFocus.com. Uh, we've been publishing now for 23 years and offer daily tips, news, and inspiration every single day uh, with all sorts of ideas up there to help you out. Thanks to the folks at Aftershoot for helping us put on today's event. I hope you guys enjoyed learning more. And uh, this has been the Lightroom Hangout. Gemma, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing some ideas. And I hope that this was just a, a nice way for people to either kick off their Monday morning or end up their Sunday night with just some ideas about creativity and how to put it all together. Thank you again, Gemma. Thank you so much for having me on. All right, everyone. Thanks again. Have a great night.